Okay, hello everyone. Sorry, I'm gonna be, have to be sitting because technical difficulties. And uh, we're all ready. Uh, I wanted to have my water here, but anyway. So let's begin. Uh, today's topics that we're gonna cover is uh, why did I choose to make this presentation? Who am I, technology, and how it has changed production? Which is basically uh, going to be a, a small reminder of history but we'll see what I'm getting uh, then later. There are some demos that uh, one of the videos I didn't play, so I maybe skip, uh, may skip one of them. Of course, the hot topic of AI art. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk a, a bit more about that. A VR and how it's going to change the industry. Uh, open source, uh, it's uh, a little bit of re open source re renaissance that we're seeing lately. And uh, then we're gonna uh, try to answer that uh, final question, hopefully, uh, and then. So next. Uh, right now, uh, why did I cho to choose to make this presentation? Uh, mainly I would like to spark a discussion on a very hot topic that a lot of you are concerned with. Uh, first, uh, a quick question. How many of you are game artists or have something to do with game art, technical art? So we have some, and uh, to those people are probably, this lecture is going to be, to be the most adequate. And uh, so yeah, next anyway, this. Okay, so this lecture is going to be a, a trip down memory lane, but uh, uh, not a nostalgia trip, because uh, I don't like to reminisce on old stuff. Uh, I'm an uh, avid uh, game developer and a passionate, uh, game jammer. So everything that you, you will hear today will be presented from a point of view of someone that's uh, very invested in the game industry. Uh, I see games as more than entertainment. Uh, they're a carrier of, of collective knowledge and a new form of art, if you will, because uh, if you think about it, uh, they contain everything uh, from uh, narrative, uh, visual arts, uh, a lot of technical, uh, prowess, and uh, they're basically carrying the culture of uh, the times that they're made of, also known as memes. Uh, the main goal is, again, to start a discussion on this uh, topic, and hopefully during the questions we will uh, have uh, a little bit of uh, a chance to get to know each other more, and uh, I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces. And I, I prepared uh, an obligatory Einstein quote for this slide which is uh, that re uh, play is the highest form of research. And might have, might have skipped some steps in the evolution of play, but you, you get the gist, I guess. So who, uh, who am I? Uh, a lot of you uh, probably seen me on uh, a lot of events because I tend to attend most of them. Uh, and here's some of my uh, game experience that you can read. I always knew that I wanted to make games, so uh, all my experience has been in the gaming industry. I never did anything else. And in the mostly in the art field, but although I do have a technical incline. Uh, some projects that I worked on with uh, some bigger studios uh, in Bulgaria. And uh, we're now uh, at my current studio, Black Sea Games. We're very hyped and have announced the launch date for our latest game, Knights of Honor 2. Are there any Knights of Honor 2 fans here? Or one? Yeah, a couple of people. All right. Uh, so uh, there's a different side of me as a developer, and that is uh, uh, from my early days, I started uh, as I was uh, uh, gaining levels and uh, experience in uh, gaming studios, I wanted to ask uh, and answer a question. Can you make a game, a game on your own? So I tried, and these are some screenshots from a solo project that I made, and the answer is no. And there was supposed to be a sound here, but anyway. Uh, so uh, well, obviously there are two asterisks, which I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on. And first thing is that there are caveats. So there are some games that people made solo and they're very popular. Uh, however, when you dive deep uh, into more into how they succeeded, it's usually either an excruciating story of self-sacrifice or they actually exaggerate their soloness. They had they usually either 
used a lot of freelancer, had some financing uh, help, uh, the back of a bigger uh, uh, publisher. So a lot, a lot of times the solo games are being uh, slightly romanticized. People want to make it seem that uh, their achievement is bigger than, than it is, even though even if you had help, it's still extremely hard to make a game. So next slide. Uh, then I tried to make some uh, smaller games for uh, mobile and release them. And these you can do on your own pretty fast. They just turn out to be not my cup of tea. Uh, and But you can churn, churn those out pretty fast, uh, publish them, and perhaps if you do monetization, even do pretty well. So if anyone is into that, uh, I would recommend starting from that. Now about that yet. Uh, we're going to look at the advances that happened during uh, probably the last 20 or 30 years uh, in the game industry. And uh, we're going to see how they changed and improved the pipelines of making games. And maybe with enough advances, uh, we will get to the point where uh, even with a small budget or a solo game developer can make uh, a game that he's uh, passionate about. So uh, another uh, question that we're going to answer is, uh, did uh, AI make our jobs easier or did they just take our jobs straight up? And uh, there's supposed to be a video here. Let's see, oh yeah, it's gonna play. They took our job! They took our job! They took your job! They took our job! They took your job! Hopefully there are some South Park fans here. Anyway, so uh, here's a quick, quick overview of the technologies that we're going to be looking at. Uh, I'm just going to skim uh, over them because they're, every topic can be very long. Uh, we're going to focus on how they uh, actually uh, sped up production times and how, for better or for worse, they actually made some roles in game production obsolete. So first it's... Uh, uh, I put it first, but there in no particular order. A lot of voxel alg algorithms have emerged lately that are used for many things. Lighting, uh, marching cubes, uh, uh, for the programmers familiar, this is a skinning method for voxel uh, meshes. Mocha fa facial capture and Mixamo uh, made animation way more accessible and uh, the animator's job easier. And also, I, I would argue, some would argue, uh, depleted some value from it. Simulations became uh, real-time or almost real-time. And uh, the demo was uh, about making an explosion. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to play, but you'll get the gist. Uh, smart materials completely changed the way we textured. Uh, now software such as uh, uh, Substance Painter, 3D Code, Substance Designer, uh, and others uh, make uh, uh, textures, uh, making textures, uh, quality textures so fast that uh, ask yourself, when was the last time that you saw uh, an advert for a job for texture artists? Because before the, every studio used to have many of them, but now I, I, haven't, I don't remember the last time I saw such an advert. And sculpting, before ZBrush, uh, people who were modeling before that remember that it was just polymodeling. Uh, rotating vertices and stuff, and uh, sculpting may, uh, ZBrush and other sculpting uh, tools made it possible to even concept in, uh, in 3D, which is uh, way faster. And uh, last but not least, the open source powered powerful tools that we have now, such as Blender. And a little bit uh, on all of this, I'll try to kind of skim uh, uh, quickly over them. So motion capture. Uh, now, this is uh, where there our first uh, kind of moral conundrum comes because uh, I, a lot of animators that I know had, had the sentiment that uh, since motion, motion capture become, uh, became widespread, they stopped being actual creative artists and started being more of a mocap cleaners which is kind of true. And uh, you will notice that with every new technology, the veterans, the one that invested a lot of time into honing their skills of making, uh, let's say in this case, handcrafted animations, uh, a little bit of uh, oppose the newer technology, which is mocap. 
but the people who just enter the industry are always quick to embrace and uh, use the newer tools. Basically, all, uh, all humans value their own time the most, right? So smart materials. Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory for every, everyone who that tried them. Uh, basically, no texture or material is made without substance painter or uh, an alternative today. I'm not going to be talking too much about this. But yeah, it basically smart materials remove the texture artist as a position in uh, in games, gaming studios. Now, usually the 3D modelers do the texturing them, themselves because it's so much faster. Simulations, and now simulations have become actually a way to model. They're become, become so, so fast because before you needed a very beefy machine and it took a lot of time to pre-render. Now you have uh, cloth brushes in ZBrush, in Blender, uh, so uh, while before when you saw, like say, a pants with sculpted uh, folds and uh, thought this artist probably spent a lot of time and uh, skill crafting this, now you know that they just uh, set up a marvelous designer and created this. And if you see something less than that, you expect the quality that simulation provides. Also, uh, it's not only cloth, it's also fluids, explosions, uh, Water is still kind of slow, but uh, uh, smoke and fire is now almost real time. We're expecting real time smoke in games any moment now. Uh, sculpting, obviously, I think I mm, went over the main things, but uh, uh, some other things that became automated in uh, modeling is UVs are now uh, almost completely automated, which is, was a very boring step of the process for modelers before. Retopology is also quite good, the automatic one. You only need to touch it up. And again, here we're coming back to that. Before you used to do everything by hand, and now you're just a cleaner for uh, the AI or uh, automatic results. Also, baking and detail transfer is very helpful for uh, textures. So uh, I, I've put on a couple of things that I, I think are coming soon. And if uh, you guys have something that I missed, maybe you can shout it out. Something that, uh, a technology that you see coming very soon in games and that will become widespread and change our, our views. Okay. And uh, skimmed over the previous topics quickly because we all, all uh, Hope that all of you tried, at least tried for a little bit, uh, the current revolution that is the AI uh, diffusion models in you know more detail, because there are a lot of AIs that are producing results on different fronts that are okay, but the diffusion models actually make concept art illust illustrations that are on a quality that matches or exceeds most artists these days. Basically, uh, AI, uh, 2D AI has become so, so good that now if you post a very good picture that you may be drawn yourself, people will, will always ask, uh, did, did AI make this? Uh, basically, your work is getting devalued to a point. But also, it is a tool, right? So uh, I, for one, uh, embrace our future uh, computer over overlords because uh, probably uh, people said the same about the... Photoshop, how, how come you don't mix your own paints, as someone said? And yeah, oh, hold on. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, sometimes I fail those and I, I wonder if we're all living in the matrix. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna need, I need some water. Sorry, guys. <coughs> All right, so what does AI do well t today? 2D art, which is stable diffusion, mid journey, DALI, probably a lot of you crafted those prompts and tried to talk to our computer overlords. Deep fakes which is basically re replacing one actor with the face of another. 
uh, they're getting also pretty good. Uh, uh, throughout the uh, slides, you will see some links to YouTube videos. Most of those are either from two-minute papers or record or digital because they also experiment a lot of uh, with these technologies. So I would recommend both cha both channels uh, to everyone who's interested to kind of be on the bleeding edge of uh, what AI does. Uh, 3D art, uh, it's kind of far away. Uh, I haven't seen any paper or realization that would create good 3D from scratch. But there are some working prototypes. Animation, now we're not talking about uh, mocap. We're talking uh, this, uh, the lower uh, screenshot is from a paper that you can find on too many pa two minute papers as a video. And uh, it shows that uh, AI can produce very good animations from scratch by learning off of mockup da data. Video, I mean, I'll just skip that. Speech and writing, like uh, you remember how uh, your voice assistant sounded like 10 years ago? Like, I, I might tell you something weary, if you remember that. And now if you ask your Google assistant something, it will, it has voices that sound like Morgan Freeman, basically. So it has advanced a lot and changed the way we interact with our computers. Now, uh, how did that power become available to the masses? Uh, Stable Diffusion released uh, their solution for free while everyone else uh, is trying to charge, albeit uh, not a very big amount of money for this. However, uh, there's a lot of drama uh, and a lot of uh, billions of dollars at stake now because this technology is obviously uh, going to change the way a lot of products are made. So if you follow up on the Reddit and stuff like that, you will, uh, you will probably sooner or later get to the drama and uh, who released what uh, and uh, why didn't they do things in a certain way. And I guess it's just when big money play and when uh, there is an open solution that is uh, competing against a paid solution, there's always going to be a little bit of a conflict of interest. And uh, these uh, links and the end is for everyone who wants to understand a little bit better uh, what it's trained on and because this will help you uh, with your prompts and uh, understanding why does it I, I understand some objects but doesn't uh, understand other well or why does it give you unpredictable results sometimes although most of the time it's pretty spot on uh, so for the first is the data set that it's uh, uh, learned on and it's that data set is searchable so if you're looking to create something with the AI that was trained on this uh, that data set uh, search the data set and see if uh, the pictures that appear there are close to what you imagine when you say that word. And if it's not, the AI will probably not understand uh, your prompt correctly. And the others are also different uh, arts that AI understands and stuff like that. Now, the morals on copyright, obviously there's a discussion going on right now, but uh, lawyers have um, had their say while, uh, while they're weren't really any lawsuits that would give us a concrete answer, but uh, the consensus among the lawyers is that it will fall uh, under the fair use. Because, uh, and uh, in terms of morals, when you think about it, what does AI do? It looks through like a huge library of pictures, learns from them and recombines them in different ways, right? What do, what do real artists do to, to become a good artist? Basically the same. We learn from different artists, we recombine them, and everything new that we invent is, we think that it's new, but it's actually just a mix of, an unpredictable mix of uh, stuff that we have already seen. So there was demo time. This was for the fluid simulation, but I think that the video isn't working. Uh, so yeah, we'll just skip it. Uh, basically, this was like a three minute video of uh, me simulating an explosion in Blender to show you how fast and easy it is now. I remember that before, what? Oh, we checked that before, it, it's not linked the video, so. It's, it's no big deal. Uh, I mean, you can just look up a tutorial explosion in Blender and it will give you like 20, some longer, some shorter.
this is the second demo. I thought about actually typing prompts into an AI, but that is always a technical difficulty with that, you know, running actual software on presenting machines. So here are a couple of illustrations that I made. I can tell the props, but they're really nothing special. So the first pictures are my attempt of on, uh, only with text make a self-portrait. You can see that, I, I would say that it's not pretty, it's not that good. <coughs> However, the second one is a, an illustration of a game jam and those are all very good. I just picked a random one. And these last two are illustrations to someone pre presenting a lecture. And you can see how those are completely usable. Like, well, before, uh, for your presentation, you had to find the stock photography to illustrate your point. Now you can just type a prompt, hey, a, a dude presenting in front of people, done. You don't need any uh, quality that is quite high for, for this type of uh, job. Also, uh, when uh, I'm saying that that portrait is pretty bad, you can actually train uh, stable diffusion on your own pictures and it will learn to understand you and mm, give you pictures that are uh, very correct. And a lot of people have done it, so it's not even a big deal today. Now about that portrait, I think that this one represents me way better. The first one, obviously. Way closer, right? Uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say here is that um, there, while it's still lacking in some areas, uh, there are technologies coming out every day. There's like uh, in painting, out painting, textual inversion, hyper networks, image to image, stuff like that that uh, you can use to fine tune your uh, pictures. So I have no doubt that it will produce very high quality work, especially when it's, once it's polished a little bit more. So next topic is virtual reality. Uh, I'll skim a little bit faster there because people either tested it and know that it works or are on the ropes about it. And I think it has still some time before it becomes mainstream. Kind of imagine the arcades before, how you had to go somewhere to play games before and now everyone has them in their home. Same with VR. Now it's still kind of expensive for home but it will probably get uh, more mainstream uh, soon. <coughs> we just click on this video while I fix myself. Oops. Mm. <laughs> Everyone's looking for a way to escape. And that's why Halliday, that's why he was such a hero to us. He showed us that we could go somewhere without going anywhere at all. You don't need a destination when you're running on an omnidirectional treadmill with quadraphonic pressure sensitive underlay. James Halliday saw the future and then he built it. He gave us a place to go. Anyway, so this was from the movie that you all know uh, about something that they're trying to recreate now in the meta metaverse, which is a buzzword, which I don't like, but hey, everyone can use whatever they want. And it looks ridiculous from the outside, but to people who tried it, especially the higher quality VR, it's really immersive. It, it actually works. And you know that it uh, has a future when uh, large corporations start investing en masse into it because usually large corporations are very conservative and don't like newer technology. Say about, uh, I, I always give the example of electric cars here, how Tesla didn't invent anything new, right? Uh, the battery technology, the motor technology, it was around them I and they repackaged stuff. They did, still did some R&D, but uh, it's not nothing groundbreaking and yet none of the bigger car manufacturers wanted to make an electric car that's this good because they just uh, didn't need to. They were selling enough uh, of what they have. Why do they need to disturb their own industry? Well, here uh, with VR, we see that uh, the big corporations are, are uh, competing to become the biggest player uh, in the field. And uh, 
Well, first thing that we have is uh, it's being uh, accessible in terms of price, which is the Oculus Quest. And also, uh, we finally have something that uh, people say is indistinguishable from uh, uh, eye quality, which is the Vario headset. Also, there is a lot of uh, innovation going on there with uh, full body tracking, and it currently works. And there are a lot of so-called VTubers have popped up, which are people who don't show their face on uh, on their videos, but use a virtual avatar and uh, use that as uh, to create a persona. Now, this is something that obviously is a uh, is up for interpretation. Is it the future or is it a fad? Is it going to pass? Is it uh, ahead of its time? I think that those early prototypes that we see on the bottom pictures, they were actually ahead of its time. You can see that I think that the first prototype was from 72 or something. Maybe it's too early. But it was very early and uh, you can imagine how the kind of quality that people got. Uh, of course, they're not going to adopt it. But now that we have uh, technology, screen technology has actually grown. I think that the time is ripe for uh, something to replace your TV, basically. Uh, next topic, open source and um, the conflict of interest connected with the open source. This is programmers who have kind of delved, delved into it uh, would know how, how much stuff there is on GitHub that's open source that you can copy and a lot of big studios do. They copy open source projects or papers scientific papers, um, package them in a different uh, suit and sell them for money, which the morals are questionable because most open source has a license that prevents it from repackaging. But then if they don't do that, uh, progress will actually hold because um, uh, there will be no way of making money and paying the bills. So while it is an area that's highly contested and a lot of people... Uh, feel strongly that uh, people shouldn't uh, abuse uh, other people's free work. Uh, I don't think that um, the uh, capitalist economy is ready for a different uh, way of work. Uh, so basically, uh, what open source is good for is uh, if something, uh, if a piece of software can be written in, let's say, a relatively short time but by one programmer, pro bono. A lot of people do that and uh, this is I think how we got uh, VLC and OBS started as a hobby project and then got expanded to become the de facto standards for what they do. But uh, some pro programs just need the support of a big corporation or uh, proven in the last years uh, uh, foundation, which is the Blender and Ubuntu foundations which help those uh, programs become uh, as big as uh, commercial products because they can afford to um, pay for support. Basically, this is the big, biggest program, pro problem of open source is that support is always lacking, lagging, and uh, say NVIDIA always has uh, money to pay off uh, hardware vendors to write good uh, drivers, while Linux, obviously, uh, programmers themselves have, have to write it. So there's a lot of conflict of interest here. Like NVIDIA doesn't want there to be good drivers for uh, Linux, let's say. But uh, again, capitalist economy, it's not fair, but it is uh, what works for now. And here's some uh, uh, software that you should be using today if you haven't heard about a lot of it, because it's open source software that's free and actually better than a lot of paid, paid counterparts. Except from open source, uh, Unity and a lot of programmers uh, embracing some cheaper uh, model have democratized development. You can imagine that a couple of years ago, uh, to become a programmer, you needed to buy Visual Studio. It cost several uh, thousand dollars. 3D Max was several thousand dollars. Now we have free game engines that are free to learn, use, and even make some money off. Uh, mock-up libraries, scan libraries, stuff like that. Steam Marketplace and uh, Epic changed the way games are distributed and killed certain retail uh, retailers of games. 
So now even hobbyists can make projects and we can see that a lot of indies have popped up that before was uh, straight up impossible. And we're nearing the end here, so uh, a quick summary is uh, uh, what we talked about today is how the technology has changed the way uh, production pipelines are set up. Uh, the AI revolution that is happening now and uh, I'm pretty sure that exciting things are still to come. VR and AR as a future medium which might replace uh, main entertainment, might not, but it's still very exciting. And uh, open source is uh, finally getting its grip and becoming not just uh, pieces of software made for hobbyists by hobbyists, but from uh, uh, but into professional tools that uh, major corporations support. So, to that question, uh, should we all embrace? Um, the cutting edge, when, it, when is it happening? Right? When are we finally going to get the best VR? When is AI going to be as easy to use as typing the prompt and it gives you perfect results? Um, and is, are those tools going to help us uh, create games that were impossible before or in terms of price or quality? Well, uh, I think that the answer for this question is not simple, but it is... Uh, something that everyone uh, has to consider for themselves. If a technology, uh, if you believe in something, then it's always beneficial to be on the forefront and be among the first to adopt it because the first early adopters are usually become industry leaders later. However, there, uh, there's always a transitional period and there probably will be for AI and VR for at least 10 years where there's still money to be made in the old way and big corporations usually choose that because they prefer to make money now as opposed to uh, invest into the future. So depending on where, where you stand, uh, it's always uh, a matter of choice. Do you want to risk a little bit and maybe then become the market leader? Or do you want to make the money where it's here and then switch when it's already popular? So I, I would like to leave you with my thoughts that uh, there are a lot of truths out there and you need to find your own. And the way I uh, uh, see the gaming industry is that no other industry invo invokes such passion from people. This is why it's, for me, it's uh, worth uh, investing your time, investing your um, money and uh, your learning ability into it. And hopefully uh, you can all make your life just one big scientific experiment of uh, trying, to, uh, trying to live a certain way. And then in the end, whether it worked or not, it's, it was still useful, right? We all know that a negative answer is also a good answer. And any questions? Questions, questions. Oh, okay, we have a question. All the way in the back. Um, in terms of AI, uh, if we assume that at some point AI might make uh, better stories than us and everything else, why, what are we even looking forward to at that point? Uh, companies and corporations are always going to uh, be more successful. And it's not like I can make a game with AI that's going to stand out in comparison to any company. So at that point, we're just sacrificing artists for companies. Isn't that it? Like, what are we... What, uh, what are the people who got into art because they love doing art, gonna gain from this whole thing. Yeah, I, I see where, where you're coming from. And it is true that, yeah, uh, AI will devalue the, the certain professions, but then this has happened uh, across mm, all history, like uh, steam engine killed the horse, right? But people loved horses, and now there are no horses to be found. Basically, I, I think that the winning strategy here is to embrace it and then just uh, during the transitional period, while AI is still not as good, 
level up to something that uh, AI can do. So basically, let's say AI does very good 2D concepts. Well, maybe people don't have to can just get inspired by AI and start making 3D uh, so from the from the, those concepts, or maybe use uh, AI to create a comic book because AI, while AI can create the pictures, it cannot coherently write the story yet. So yeah, basically people just have to evolve and step up above the, uh, what AI can do today. I, I, that, that's my take on it. But yeah, there are uh, moral implications to both. And I think that this is not the first time in history that a such conundrum has happened. I have another question about AI. Uh, so for me, it seems that you say, in your opinion, it's a tool, right? Yeah but they market it as a replacement. From what I've seen, it clearly says it, that it's replacement. It does, they do. Um, yeah. yeah. Not sure. Um, basically the, the people who would say that is, uh, I think it's just uh, marketing people that like big buzzwords and that want say mid journey to get more investment. So they say, you know, we'll take down the moon for you yeah. and I will do everything. We all know that uh, this is currently even, and probably for a long time will not be the case. Even, even if uh, a company decides to massively use AI in their production, they're still gonna need artists to clean up the 12 fingers that AI produces currently. And even if AI fixes the, the amount of fingers it does, there will still be a lot of work uh, connected with the, uh, because it's not only about making, a, a, art is not about making a good looking picture. It's about uh, making a coherent uh, product. And that product in, uh, is way more than uh, a picture that can be said with a prompt. Again, there's a story behind it. There's technical limitations that AI doesn't know how to take into account. Uh, let's say an artist knows that, say, our engine doesn't support uh, rendering hair very well. But it's very hard to pinpoint to the AI that don't give me this type of hair, give me that type of hair. So artists are still uh, going to contribute maybe in different ways and, and during the period that where they will grow into something like maybe we will won't have 2D artists in the future, we'll have uh, world builders that will be our name and who knows. With the help of the AI we can build the world but the AI cannot do it yet on its own until we have general AI at least. Well, yes, but let's say in 50 years the AI gets so good that anyone who, just the regular person can make whatever they want, then why would, uh, why would anyone really care? Like... Well, yeah, they won't. <laughs> in, 50, in 50 years, I think that the... Mm, to the artists will be extinct, but then in 50 years, VR will probably be uh, everywhere. So mm, the need for 2D pictures will be just for concepts and artists will uh, evolve to pr produce content for VR, let's say. So yeah, we have to evolve with the times. Yeah, Th thank you. Any more questions, last questions? Ah, Bob Sana. So you listed all those open source tools. Are you using them in Pretty much. Uh, I listed the ones I use, so there are probably even more than that. I, I use every single one of them, yeah. No, I and, mean and like I, the company itself. Sir? Oh, inside the company? Uh, yes, actually most of them. Like maybe we don't use Ubuntu because it's kind of yeah, harder. Obviously. I use, I, I run Linux on my home machines. So the modeling is in yeah, Blender? Yep, we, we model in Blender. Uh, I use Krita extensively. And those other, the simpler ones are just for quality of life, like browsers and stuff. Cool, is that it? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Anton.